ladies and gentlemen. It's our uh, thank you all for 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 uh, for tuning in tonight. Um, it is our May local history guild, um, and uh, I guess by dint of the fact that you are that you are here, you are a participant uh, in the local history guild. That makes you a member. Um, so um, tonight. We are talking about a fabulous book, um, In Pursuit of History, a lifetime collecting colonial American art and artifacts with the editor and curator, curator uh, Debbie Reebok, Reebok, and the editor, uh, and you're chairman of the board, too, of the Dietrich American Foundation, Richard Dietrich. Um, welcome. Uh, welcome, Richard. Welcome, Debbie. Um, Thanks for coming, and um, you know it's a, it's a, it's a real pleasure to talk about you know talk about a great big you know it's not a, it's beyond a catalog this thing this is like <laughs> it is a catalog sort of in a way but it but it the way you've structured it with with these with these people you know who, who are sort of experts in their field writing about uh 18th and 19th century manuscripts 19th century 18th and 19th century furniture china trade uh great paintings and this is a this is a this is a great uh collection with a um you know with a with a mission so it's not just a private collection is it uh that's right michael thank you um well i'm thrilled to be here and uh really really grateful for this i know debbie is too and um so the book um, is something that we, the Dietrich American Foundation, uh, decided about four years ago to do a book. And when we did that, we identified authors. We wanted to break it down into sections. And Michael, we were so thrilled that you agreed to do the section on whale trade related items. And it's um, just, uh, it's a great section of the book. I think on our Amazon reviews, we only have like two written reviews, maybe three at this point. But one of them is saying that they really enjoyed the whale trade section. Yeah. So that was heartening. Um, but the, um, the, the impetus for this was really that we as a foundation put things on loan to historic houses and um, different institutions. And that's really our mission. Our biggest partner in all this is the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And then our books and manuscripts are a second big piece of the collection. And our partner there is Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. And so when we decide to do the book, the Philadelphia Museum of Art agreed to um, do it in association with us. So we have pu published it in association with them. And then we were lucky to have Yale University Press um, carry the title, which, is, which has been great. So I think, why don't I um, share the screen and then Debbie and I were gonna really um, sort of trade off as we present some of this stuff and really also leave a lot of room for question and answers because we're so thrilled to be here with everybody and I know we I can see the list of participants um, but um, you know it, it, it's so great to virtually be together. So I hope people can see that that's again as Michael Perfect. showed that's the cover I've got a copy also with me um, but this is something that it's open right there to Debbie's section Debbie wrote on China trade related items and so that has a nice kind of resonance for tonight too with New Bedford and whaling and maritime. And so th these two areas really, whaling and, and maritime and China trade were really a key focus of my father and as a collector, he really loved the sea and the lore of the sea and just had it, you know, there was kind of a deep uh, resonance in that, those kind of objects. And here's a, here's a shot of him. I think it's always interesting to see you know the collector of of something that when you envision you know collections that that we all hear about well who assembled those and this is the man who did this is my father and this is taken in 1963 he was about 25 at the time he graduated from college in um, 1960 and um, he went to wesleyan university and what's kind of amazing about him is, is he early on, very early, really as an undergraduate, developed this uh, deep love of history and also a love of collecting. And the things that he collected as an undergraduate were just books that he enjoyed as a reader. So, you know, works by 
Herman Melville, um, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Hemingway, others. I mean, books that he just really enjoyed to read. And at the time he wasn't collecting first editions necessarily, but he was collecting what he could. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the sort of seed of collecting started then. This is the family business. This is Luden's cough drops. And so as a young man, my father always had a notion that he'd enter this business. It was started uh, by William Luden, but early on in 1928, my grandfather and great uncle bought the company from Luden. And the company was in Reading, Pennsylvania, um, popularized by Monopoly, the Reading Railroad. And Luden was one of these just great American success stories. He basically invented the menthol cough drop. And so he saw people walking around with little tins of menthol and thought there's something to that. And they'd use that as a throat lozenge. Um, but he, he thought if I could combine that with candy and he, he had always wanted to be a candy maker. And he started out in candy because a childhood friend of his had a father who was a candy maker and he thought I, I could do that. And so he, he did it and he worked with a local pharmacist who combined menthol with a clear kind of Pennsylvania German style candy called a Moshi. And that Moshi was just, you know, a, a sweet candy, clear in color, a penny candy kind of thing. But when it was combined with the menthol, it became um, a, a cough drop. And in a sort of early effort at guerrilla marketing, he actually got the, the man who works on the Reading Railroad to use them and carry around little tins with the cough drops. And he gave them to, to them for free. And as they went far and wide, people said, what do you have? And it was, you know, a Luden's cough drop. So he grew this company into, you know, what you see in the picture. And here's a picture of him. And he, when he decided to sell the company, he really wanted to do it because he just was at the, you know, a retirement age and just wanted to kind of move on from business, but he really wanted to sell it to a single owner. And so these two, my grandfather and great uncle were 24 and 19 at the time. And it's just an audaciously young age. And they had an uncle who um, had gotten to know Luden and had, you know, friends in the Reading business elite. These, you know, two brothers were from Reading and they floated a $5 million bond and they raised the rest of the money and they bought the company for $7 million. And then it was really off to the races with, um, you know, candy production and, and growing the business. But again, my father thought that, that this is something he'd do, but he didn't realize when he'd do it. And so he ended up having to take on that. When he was in business school, he dropped out of business school and his father passed away. And that was in 1962. And his uncle had already died um, several years before. And so suddenly, you know, at this age of 24, suddenly this was thrust upon his shoulders. And again, at this incredibly young age, like it was with, uh, by choice in the case of his dad and uncle, but in, in his case, he, he had to take it on. So he was the oldest of two brothers and the three of them really took on this challenge. But one of the things very quickly that he suddenly had the means to do this and collecting was something that really was kind of a source of comfort in a really tough time, I think. And this is a very early piece that he collected. And what this is, is as everyone will see, it's a scrimshandered tooth. Uh, but it says, if you can read that, view of the Wesleyan University Middletown. So this was by the Connecticut Cityscape Engraver. And it was, um, it was rendered uh, really soon after Wesleyan was established. And so for my father, this was this great find. And Debbie, do you remember where this was purchased? Sorry. To I get my button there. Um, I actually believe he got this through a dealer at, in, from, in all places from Texas. But it was a dealer that he worked with on um, purchasing Proctor and Pennsylvania German objects. And um, somehow the, the dealer came up with the scrimshaw. There's actually a, a pair of these. Um, with other, Michael, you might remember the other views. Um, yeah, there's two of them <clears throat> in our collection here. There's a there's a, a view of the of the uh, common in New Haven, and I forget. I, I was just looking at it. Um, another 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 Connecticut cityscape view uh, mm -hmm. with a steamer with a with a steamship coming into the harbor on the on the Verso. Um, so it's it's a very distinctive hand. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Well, so then what he ended up um, kind of tying into the books and manuscripts, really books that he collected in college, he early on 
the, the focus for him was, you know, a couple things like that whale tooth, but really it was on, um, it was on works on paper. And so this was um, a, a longtime dealer's collection came up for sale, a man named Forrest Sweet. And this was one of the key pieces in the Sweet collection. And I think, Debbie, I think he acquired this in maybe 64, but mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was basically a letter from George Washington to Lund Washington, who was the caretaker of Mount Vernon during the Revolutionary War. And what's really extraordinary about this, I mean, the contents of the letter are incredible because as you can see here, the date, if you can make that out, it says Falls of Delaware, South Side, 10 December. And the letter begins on the 10th of December, resumes on the 17th, it's a long letter. And then of course, eight days later, Washington crosses the Delaware and the course of the revolution changes forever after that. So just, you know, an amazing piece, but, but when he bought that from this sale, um, suddenly he was, he was, you know, very, very young and he was suddenly kind of in the landscape of these uh, collectors. He was no slouch of a collector, this guy. I mean, like every piece is a brilliant piece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, Mike, I mean, I, I think, Michael, that he he was so lucky in a sense to be collecting at the time he did because it was in the 1960s and they were coveted, but not in the same way as later. So suddenly he was able to do this. Um, similarly, you know, this was this ended up being the most important book that he ever collected. This is George Washington's copy of the Acts of Congress from uh, 1789. And this was the, the Harry Flint sale um, or Henry Flint sale um, uh, to benefit um, Deerfield. So basically the Flints had an incredible collection and they wanted to sell some to really establish historic Deerfield and do all the incredible renovations that, you know, that people enjoy today up uh, in Deerfield, Mass. Yeah, and this well, Rich, one- Richard, let me ask you something here. Did, was this in the chapter that, that Bill Reese wrote? Did he, did he cover this material? Debbie, did this make it into the book? We sold this before the book was written. And let me... Um, I, a, I believe it is in the book. I know he talks about it in the it's, book. It's just sort yeah. of, it's really sort of really great to, to let people know, you know, that the, man, that the books and manuscripts section of In Pursuit of History was written by William, William Reese, Bill Reese, you know, the great uh, rare book and, and Americana manuscript, you know, dealer in, in New Haven. Um, uh, and you want to know a little bit about him, you can look him up on, on the internet um, and, and see what his incredible contributions. He wrote essays after essays after essays in the text of talks to the Gruyere Club and the, and the American Antiquarian Society and the Library of Congress and, and his catalogs, you know, I still use them. They're still back in the stacks. We got them back there. We use them and I have them at home, I use them for, for reference. And, you know, to, to, to walk into the room and realize that the, that the guy writing the chapter on the, on the Dietrich American manuscript collection was Bill Reese, wow. You know, that was, that was a moment, that was, that, was a, that was a moment. So I just wanted to interject that and let- Well, thank you, yeah. thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, we were so lucky to have him uh, do that. And he wrote the lead off section, really. I wrote the intro on my father and then the next, the, the true section of the, you know, sections on the collection was, was his books and manuscripts. And he wrote it, I mean, with such speed and efficiency and, and beauty that everybody then followed suit. And the way he wrote it was he described the objects as they came into the collection. And that was kind of neat because then you could really sort of see the arc of the collector, you know, that the tastes were changing and the way he was collecting were changing. And um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, and just tying into, you know, so again, whale trade related stuff was really important and, um, and history was really important. And these are really fun because that's George and Martha Washington. And George has a kind of a, a scene of a whaling scene in, in the Pacific. And then Martha has a, a lovely urn above her head. Uh, but um, this is a pair of teeth, not, you know, uh, different sides of the same tooth, uh, but be beautifully done. And then um, this was this was the uh, the the land where um, my father um, grew up in Villanova, Pennsylvania. But he moved out with his brothers out to uh, Chester County in the in the uh, late 1960s. And so again, soon after he took on Ludens, they were um, moving out there. And the reason they did it is to create a dairy farm. 
And the dairy farm was a, kind of an effort at vertical integration to take you know, milk for the milk chocolate at Luden's because it wasn't just cough drops, it was a lot of chocolate, Fifth Avenue bars, seasonal varieties, you know, um, solid chocolate, um, this and that for seasonal stuff like Easter, Christmas. And so what's interesting about this is they built the state-of-the-art dairy farm and really the moment it became operational, best practices in candy making changed and it turned to powdered milk. And so none of the milk from this dairy ever made it into uh, oh. Luden's. <laughs> which is too bad. And it, they were all kind of crestfallen about that, but they continued on. And some of the Ludens made it into some of this meal that the cows were, were really, you know, before there was sort of, um, uh, you know, um, grass fed was a thing. They're not eating grass here, but there was uh, a lot of open field grazing on those open fields. But then some of this um, feed that they were eating actually they'd take candy bars and grind that up. And so it was sort of the broken bars in the assembly process. And it was just a nice source of protein. They so all look pretty happy. Lucky cows, yeah. <laughs> and then this was his house. And this, this was contiguous to that farmland. Um, and he grew up here. And so what this did suddenly, and he moved in with my mother at the very end of the 60s, they bought this. They moved in in 1972, but they bought it in the late 60s, started renovating it. And if you can see on my, my cursor there, there's a line in the stone here. And this was from 1721, this section, it was just kind of a room over room. And uh, one family owned it for about 200 years and they expanded it, added these different sections. And then when my father and mother moved in there, suddenly what he was able to do is, 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 is collect more three-dimensional stuff and, and decorate a house and think about walls and where he'd put things. And so some of this is happening here. And this is the den. And there's a Boston family here, the Barnabys. Um, there's this wonderful um, portrait of this uh, British officer who, who turned Creek Indian in Florida as, as the revolution ended and uh, sort of a wild character in history. And then there's this um, armband. So this is the kind of stuff he was collecting. This is Joseph Richards in Philadelphia. And this is you know, these silver armbands would be used for Indian diplomacy, but I just put it in there because this guy's wearing a silver British officer's gorget. He could easily be wearing an armband. Um, and then here's the, the more formal uh, room in the house. And this has a great overmantel painting that again, a great um, maritime scene, this is Connecticut. And here's a, a detail of that. And um, Debbie, I forgot when this was painted, this scene. Um, I, um, um, I believe it's, you on the spot. Um, it's, I guess I should look it up. No, um, no. I'm, I'm so, gonna say it's like 1770, I, I could be wrong. Um, the painter, Buddington was um, 13 years old at the time he painted this, believe it or incredible. not. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Um, and they really haven't been able to identify everything in the painting, but this detail that shows the fort, um, they think was an early 17th century fort that was destroyed by fire. Um, and he just kind of, you know, recreated what he thought it looked like. Um, it's, it's called Cannon's Wharf. At the, we don't have a detail of it, but if you look, I don't know, Richard, if you could do the cursor to the upper at the end of yeah. a, a lane is the house that was believed to be Cannon's house yeah. that was built. And these would the be merchant ships. Mm -hmm. And that I think is supposed to be Norwalk, Connecticut. Correct. Yeah. Those merchant ships are, those are pretty wonderful, uh, pretty wonderful views. If you see this, it's got a very high stern here, very bluff bow. Uh, it's got, you know, uh, it's got, it has a poop deck, you know, uh, this, a vessel of this sort would have been in common use from, you know, from the 1770s right up to there was a similar one built in New Bedford around 1812, 1812, um, and uh, it, it's a classic um, vessel type. Hey, we got a question in the chat here from yeah. the previous slide. Yes. Uh, let's see. It was um, Alan Wyman is asking if this is in fact uh, uh, Chief Osceola, uh, the Sem Seminole. 
Uh, no, this is actually good question. I don't know if he ever adopted an Indian name like that, but his name was William Augustus Bowles, and he he was born in Frederick, Maryland, and then uh, enlisted in the you know kind of the Loyalist regiment. So he wasn't in the full British army, but he was under a British command, and then he really had kind of behavioral issues. I think he wasn't the easiest guy to, you know. I think he was reprimanded a little bit. But when they when they lost, he fled to Halifax and then um, with the British Army, and then from there said, you know, tack with this, and he went to Florida and he was harassing the Spanish, kind of on behalf of the British as a privateer. But an incredible, colorful guy, and in some ways you don't know if all of it's true. But it's but he died in a uh, in Cuba on a hunger strike. He was captured by the Spanish and he died yeah. in Cuba. Well, being a Britisher, harassing the Spanish as a privateer is the thing to do. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, I will try to advance to... And I just looked up that Buddington painting was painted in 1792. Okay, so. yep, okay. just after the... Look at mm -hmm. this gorgeous thing. Yeah, so this was, I, I, this is from Lancaster and this is a high chest and it's this kind of stuff that he was suddenly able to collect and um, as well as things like this. So this is Pennsylvania German, uh, later 1830s, um, the other one, you know, 1770s, but this is, um, you know, beautiful, this kind of painted furniture. So he loved all this, this both Southeastern Pennsylvania, very different styles. Where does that high boy live now? Is that, that in the Philadelphia Museum of Art? It is, yeah. Uh, actually, it was for many years uh, on view at the Philadelphia Museum, but it has recently gone out to um, Historic Trap, Pennsylvania. They have a new center for the uh, study of Pennsylvania German studies. And it's now on view out there in Trap, which is about 45 minutes west of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That, wasn't, that would have been built, built by an English, an English woodworker. Yes, a cabinet maker. Well, um, it, yeah, possibly. I mean, possibly somebody who, um, I think actually we, I don't have the name, but yeah. um, well, we'll but, look it up. But that would have been, I mean, very possibly somebody who was born in England. It's a fabulous thing, man. Yeah, it's so it's so beautiful, and it's interesting that it's from Lancaster. So you think stuff like that was only being made in Philadelphia, but yeah. not true. Yeah, and then this this great so this again ties in. This was in our dining room growing up, and this is uh, called After the Storm. It was 1865 by William Bradford. And it's, you know, just, uh, again, this love of the ocean of history that my father had. And this is very much um, Bradford, who's, you know, known for his Arctic scenes and, and less so scenes like this. But this is clearly um, the impact of the Civil War, you know, so after the storm, and we have this ship that, you know, might well be the sort of the ship of state coming back into harbor. Um, Michael actually pointed out when we were talking that, that this, um, these are the Gay Head Cliffs of the vineyard. And if this were correct, the ship might in fact be leaving the harbor. But I think Bradford probably intended it to be seeking well, refuge. I don't know. I mean, after a storm like that, they don't know whether they're coming or going. They're in pretty tough shape there. Um, yeah. If I were them, I'd go back to New Bedford and get a re-rig. I would indeed, yeah. <laughs> Maybe never go back to sea. Um, so again, this is back in the um, the formal dining room or the formal living room, and this is uh, uh, you know probably I, I think really the the assemblage that my father was most proud of, and so he had coupled these things together, and it's the first piece of furniture um, by Nathaniel Gould that he you know, his first piece of major decorative art and uh, not Gould's first piece, but this beautiful Bombay, you see the curved Bombay form, and this is a slant front desk. And then above it is a John Singleton Copley portrait of a boy with a squirrel. Um, the boys of Boston, well, uh, South Carolina um, individual, but it was painted in Boston. He had family in Boston. But then importantly below that is this wonderful uh, silver teapot and there it is again. And the teapot um, was made by Paul Revere. And so um, when we as a foundation decided to do a show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we were really happy that they agreed to do it. And this was something that opened about a year ago. And Debbie did an amazing job 
pulling together these assemblages of different objects and choosing which objects. And this was, as you walked in, this was the, the first thing that people saw. And so, you know, very much recreated as it was in the living room. And here again, we have the teapot and this is a Paul Revere print. And that was in fact on the desk as well at my father's home. The amazing thing about the teapot is that it is the teapot that Revere holds in the John Singleton Copley uh, portrait of Revere that's at the Boston Museum of Fine Art. Yeah, you, don't, you don't own that. We do not own that, oh, I yeah. wish, wish we did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a great painting and it's Revere in his you know, shirt sleeves and he's, his family apparently wanted him to be painted more formally and he chose to show himself as a, as a, as a, you know, a tradesman. And, but it's, it's very much the teapot that we have. And then, so this I is- I was gonna say, Richard, if you yeah. go back though to the grouping, yeah, I think the grouping tells a lot about Richard Dietrich as a collector, because what he was really interested in was pulling together objects. He wasn't just a silver collector or a furniture collector or a painting collector. He liked to collect it all. And all of these objects were made within the span of about three or four years. And, and to him, it tells the story of what was happening in Boston and Salem in the um, years 1766 to 68, which were critical years in American history. So he loved history and he loved getting the objects that would reflect a certain time and then combining them together. It's what made him really special, I think, as a collector. I, I love that. Thanks, Debbie. That's really mm -hmm. good because you're right. They all tie together by time period, by place, by artist. Um, and it, it is connecting all those dots. He, he did love that. Um, so this is- Carl, in, Carl Cruz has a question about that yeah. print. Uh, if we go back to the print for a second. Um, yeah, is that the Boston Massacre? No, it's no. the view of the year 1766, right, Debbie? I, I 1765. 1765. Mm -hmm. Right. We do, it, Richard did have a, um, and we do still have in the collection, an engraving of the Boston Massacre by Revere. Um, and he did used to have that in his living room. But when this one came up for sale, it to him, oh, it's 1765. And my uh, Copley portrait of John B. Holmes is 1766. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it really fit the story for him. And I believe Revere was painted in 1765, this painting. And we oh, think the teapot right. was mm -hmm. made about 1765. So as Debbie said, it was that like planetary alignment kind of thing happening there with all those. And so this in the, the exhibit, there were about 55 objects. And this is the, the, the Philadelphia section, the Pennsylvania section of kind of higher style objects. And then we had a New England section. And again, here's another Copley portrait. This is of uh, um, Josiah Quincy, a Boston merchant. And then that comes to, um, we're gonna go through a couple other images of the exhibit, but Michael, um, this suddenly is um, whale trade objects. And this is really, you don't see these at the Philadelphia Museum of Art very, very often. We were so thrilled to have them there. Is that, is that right? The Philadelphia Museum of Art doesn't, do they have a scrimshaw collection? I don't think they have any. No, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think you should learn them some scrimshaw and <laughs> You know, look, Philadelphia needs to know about Scrimshaw uh, for the very reason that they sold so much of New Bedford's whale oil. And we'll be getting to that, you know, in, in a little bit. But, you know, the Philadelphia Quakers and New Bedford Quakers and Nantucket Quakers are tied very, very closely together. Uh, Charles W. Morgan, um, Charles Wallen Morgan, um, you know, the, the, the Joseph Schumacher Russell. Um, and I was just, you know, just earlier today doing a, a little bit of work on the, um, the uh, Association for, for the Relief of Aged Women here in New Bedford, which was founded by uh, a woman named Rachel Howland. Rachel Howland was a Quaker. Uh, she was from Jersey. She was from just on the other side of the river from Philadelphia, but, uh, but you know, she married a New Bedford, a New Bedford Quaker. Um, so, you know, the Philadelphia Museum of Art has every reason to put whaling objects on exhibit. <laughs> okay. They should not be shy about that. Uh, okay. And, you know, this is a greatest hits. I mean, look at this. You got, you have one, two, 
you have one, two, three, four pieces, you know, a ditty box, a pair of teeth, a single tooth, and a panel. And it's like the, it's like some of the Scrimshaw's greatest hits. You know, right in the center is a is a Susan's tooth. You know, from yeah, a Frederick I'll... Meyer tooth. Um, uh, one of thirty six or thirty seven teeth that he that he engraved um, while whaling on the ship Susan of Nantucket on the coast of South America on the coast of Japan in the Pacific between. 1828 and uh, 1830 or so, and uh, and it's they're, they're they are the quintessential Yankee whaling representative art. Um, above and beyond, even the logbooks and the journals, the Susan's teeth have it all. They have they have the patriotic motifs. They've got the you know they've got the eagle. They have uh, every now and again he'll sign one of them. Uh, and this particular tooth, you know, actually says, you know, Ship Susan of Nantucket, uh, Frederick Swain Master uh, on it. Uh, and then and then there's all the very interesting details of the whaling. And, um, you know, and at the Kendall Whaling Museum some years back, uh, we did a, uh, well, it was, you know, we did this. Um... Well, you were there, Debbie. Did, did you come up for that? For the, I um, did not. No, I wish I had that. You know, yeah. we did this this symposium, you know, on, on Frederick Meyer. And here's the catalog resume. And of course, the two teeth from the Dietrich American Foundation are in there. There's this tooth, and then there's the other one, uh, which with the silver bindings on the tip and the base uh, connected with a chain. Absolutely beautiful thing. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, you know, this has the, sometimes when I give my tours of the museum, I say, look, you know, you, I, I'm going to say something here. And after you hear what I say, you don't really have to know anything else about Yankee whaling. Uh, this is the entire story. And that goes like this, death to the living, long life to the killers, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to whaling. Um, and that, was, that came from this couplet that was engraved on, on the Susan's, on, uh, by Frederick Meyrick on these teeth. Um, you know, uh, they're apologizing for nothing. So, you know, this is a, appropriate, I don't know, this is a, this is a worthwhile response, you know, in the 21st century, you know, in our post 1960s sort of uh, understanding of the way humankind has destroyed the planet and whales, of course, are, are you know, really charismatic animals and they have carried the, the so much of the hopes and dreams and, and love of, of, of people with nature. Uh, we have whales are, the, are, are our poster child uh, and, and, you know, it's so easy to look back and say, oh, it was off people. You know, how could they do that? How could they kill those poor whales? How could they kill those poor whales? Success to sailors' wives and greasy luck to whalers. Those guys are apologizing for nothing. They're saying this is how we earn our living. And this, this tooth is, a, is representative of American maritime culture. It's a maritime culture. It's not an accident. It, it's not something that somebody else did, uh, and 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 it and, and it's not fiction. Uh, all of this stuff happened, and these pieces we can even, we can even go on to the next one if, if you like. Yeah, um, you know these okay. pieces are representative of that culture. Um, this particular piece, I fell in love with this piece. Um, do we have? Do you have that second? Oh picture? no, That's my right. fault. Um, Sorry, right. people will buy the book because. Um, if they don't, when they come to the museum, I'm going to frown at them. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's, let's go back. Yeah, this one. This uh, mm. this ditty box is a very interesting piece to me because, unlike you know, uh, Richard Dietrich worked with a number of of um, sort of what what would you call them the, the the people who who helped guide his collecting. Yeah, I mean, he worked with a number of advisors and dealers, and uh, but the advisors were primarily dealers or people in the yeah. auction world. And then he also um, really developed these these deep bonds with fellow collectors, and I think that that was a big part of it too. This piece really stood out as odd because it came from Joe Kindig in York, Pennsylvania, um, and I didn't see Kindig's name turning up much in in the in the in certainly in the in the whaling trade at all and so i started paying attention because i'm from york and i worked my first museum job was across the street from 
Joe Kindred's shop at the at the Gates House and Plow Tavern in York, PA. You know, these are these are colonial era structures, and and they have fabulous collections in them, largely built by Joe Kindig, who donated them to the Historical Society of York County. So I was particularly interested in this. And then on the other side of this, uh, you'll see the, the photos in the book. Let me women. let me go uh, really low tech. Yeah, good. There it is. You can see these women. <laughs> Those women struck me right away as like I've seen them before, and so I started looking, you know, into the collection, and sure enough. Uh, there are pieces here in this collection that were attributed to Manuel Enos. Um, and uh, Manuel Enos was a, is, a, is a pretty famous uh, whaleman, whaling master and scrim shandy. Uh, a ditty box is just simply a, um, it's a, this one is made out of uh, the jawbone of a sperm whale cut very, very thin and steam bent and around a form. And so the bottom is steam bent around a form and then it'll have a piece of pine, an oval piece of pine will be sawn and fitted inside and tacked down with, with little tacks uh, into the bottom. And then the top will be crafted in the same way so that that bone overlaps the bottom oval. And then the top has its own set of inlays and you can put things in it. What do you want? What do you want to put in it? You could put, you could put yarn in it if you wanted to. You could put, uh, you could put articles of clothing, gloves, you know, maybe a hat. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're a presentation from a whaleman to a, a significant female other, um, generally. And uh, they, many pieces of scrimshaw were made by whalemen as presentation pieces to significant female others. Um, but, you know, this one, uh, this one is particularly fun. That's great. And this is particularly fun. This is a fabulous thing. Uh, this is a Joseph Schumacher Russell of New Bedford opened a sperm oil, lamp oil and sperm oil store in Philadelphia. Uh, and he sold New Bedford oil and, uh, and he sold lamps from, uh, from, well, they were liver, they were called Liverpool lamps. And the only reason I know that is because we have a sketch of this same scene here in the museum um, that shows the outside of the store. And then there was another painting of the inside that shows an African-American man uh, working in the oil store, in the lamp store, alongside like another another fellow, maybe Russell himself. I'm not sure who it was. Um, uh, and we we bid on that uh, at an auction some years back, and, and we didn't get it. And here, uh, I was doing some research last week for another program, and and, and here that picture uh, turned up. At, uh, the Smithsonian bought it, so it's in it's in the uh, Museum of American History, uh, and the Smithsonian owns it. Um, so, uh, so the New Bedford Whaling Museum, the Dietrich American Foundation, and the Smithsonian <laughs> uh, <laughs> documentation of, Sh of Joseph Schumacher Russell's uh, retail uh, sperm oil and lamp store in Philadelphia. Great. Oh, and there it is, Michael, right there, folks. Oh, so yeah. People looking. It's a small uh, little uh, painting there. Right between a a, a Charles Sidney Raleigh and an Armbrose Luis Garnere, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty brilliant. Yeah, so, um, and this, I believe, is the whale ship Minerva, this, uh, this painting. And then the Garnere is, we have a detail of it here. That's a crazy painting. Yeah, yeah. So this is the um, Constitution versus the Guerriere. And um, it is an incredible scene. It's a great thing. I mean, Ambrose Luis Garnere was a great marine painter. He was a, you know, in the French Navy, um, captured, uh, uh, captured by a British uh, in the Indian Ocean. And, and he was uh, imprisoned for some years um, and really began his painting career after he got out of, out of prison after the, after the war. He came from a family of painters. He painted, you know, he, uh, well, I don't know if he painted, he must have painted whaling scenes, but the prints, right, Debbie? I mean, that's all we have. Well, yeah, there's a series of prints that the Garnery prints are very famous, you know, Cache de Pachelot and, and Cache de la Beline, uh, mentioned by Melville and Moby Dick. And, and you know, they're just they're like pictures that everybody can recognize. But, you know, Garnery painted this particular scene, well, this particular event, I should say, 
at least three or four times, the USS Constitution Museum has a watercolor of this event by him. But this particular scene is just crazy with the seas all huge and uh, just extra dramatic. It's great. Uh, Richard mentioned earlier his, uh, his father's interest in Washington. And so when we did this special exhibit, I did a little uh, section here of just Washington material. And just like when he did the vignette of different mediums, it, you'll find Washington represented in virtually every chapter in the book because he collected paintings with Washington in them, such as this uh, Hicks painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. This is actually one of two versions of that, that um, scene that he collected. Um, and he, as we said, um, had a lot of books and documents, uh, Washington owned books, um, letters by Washington. I think there were 66 in the collection. We didn't exhibit any of the um, manuscript materials, but Bill Reese talks about them in his chapter. Um, but he also had porcelain uh, that was owned by Washington or had Washington um, vignettes on them. And then of course, there's this wonderful uh, miniature portrait of Washington that was done by James Peel. Uh, it's signed and dated uh, 1788 by James Peel, who was the younger brother of Charles Wilson Peel. And it's just such a magnificent image that this is what we decided to use on the cover of our book. Um, and it's, when it was originally painted, it was um, believed to have been put on the cover of a snuff box. But in the 19th century, um, it was uh, sold to a artillery company, the Washington huh. Corps, uh, or the Artillery Corps of the Washington Grays. And they had this very elaborate uh, watch case, gold watch case made to house the miniature in. And it's really very cool. The front of the locket has a view of Washington um, crossing the Delaware. The back of it has a view of Mount Vernon. And then Richard, if you go to the next slide, if you open the back compartment, you actually see some of Washington's hair. So it's really just an overall great um, object. And the watch case itself was made by a uh, goldsmith in Philadelphia. Um, and then I mentioned uh, porcelain. These are a pair of custard cups that have the tomb of Washington. Uh, Washington died in 1799, but his memorial tomb wasn't actually built until, I think, 1831. But right after his death, scenes like this that had the motifs of mourning, such as a willow, weeping willow, or and then the eagle, um, began to be made. So these were made really the, you know, in the early 1800s before there ever was the um, memorial to Washington and owned the monogram is for Joseph Sims of Philadelphia. So um, that was a good connection. Um, then this platter and plate is from uh, the porcelain service, the Society of the Cincinnati, that's the emblem in the center of the Society of the Cincinnati that was actually part of George Washington's service. He had a service of 302 pieces. Um, it was ordered on the, um, first voyage to China. Um, and these are actually the very first pieces that Richard bought for the foundation. So these were purchased wow. in 1963. And it, um, I think it just is a great example of how he was so interested in history and in Washington, and then chose to, you know, start off the collection with a bang with just these, you know, wonderful examples of China's export porcelain. He, uh, uh, at one point, the foundation um, owned 19 pieces of the service. Um, where, where are these pieces now? They're at the Philadelphia Museum. Uh -huh. um, we have some other pieces that are on loan to Arlington House um, in Arlington, Virginia. Um, we actually have, there were other services with the Society of the Cincinnati that were made for the other members of the society, which were all um, French and American veterans of the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. So we also own pieces from the William Eustis service, from Henry Knox's service and Samuel wow. Shaw. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, and they're all a little bit different. Some um, use just the Angel of Fame there that you see in the center. Some, the um, emblem on the right with the, the ribbon and the blue is what the actual badge of the Society of the Cincinnati was. Uh, this gives you a view of, we, and so in addition to having the porcelain in the Washington section, I also did a little section on the China trade, which is right there, which is circling. And the high chest is actually not from China, but it definitely shows the Chinese um, decorative scheme. It's a Boston piece made by John Brokos, and um, it is Japan with, um, on the front, it's kind of hard to see in this. Yeah. Um, and then I had a few pieces of porcelain there and also um, some paintings. And Richard, again, was interested in exploring the China trade through not only porcelain, but also through paintings and prints. This particular painting is of a Hong merchant. Um, the Hong merchants were the actual person that a Westerner met to deal with when when um, purchasing merchandise. They were selected by the Chinese government um, to be an intermediary between the manufacturers and the um, European and American traders. Um, so this was done um, probably by an um, artist named Lam Kwa, who was a very successful um, portrait painter. He did, you know, European and American um, ship captains as well and merchants as well as uh, Chinese Hong merchants and he, he had a studio of maybe 10 to 12 painters in his studio at the time. Yeah it's wonderful Debbie because it's it's kind of great to think of the American um, merchant you know mariner taking this home and proudly displaying it in their home and mm -hmm. showing it's a real east meets west with you know this person who was their counterpart in China and they're showing their friends and family who they work with in China. Um, and then there were also um, scenes that were made that the American traders took back home that showed porcelain production or tea production. And they were usually made in albums of like 12 uh, we have some watercolors that show, um, you know, a couple of the scenes in the production. This is actually an oil painting. In the upper left corner, there's a number six. So it shows that this was sixth in the line of really? how they would depict the production of China. But this is wonderful. If you look at each little detail, you see them painting, uh, throwing the potter, uh, pottery on the wheel in the left. Uh, you see them packing in wicker baskets in the front left. You see the porcelain laid out to dry on the racks in the front. Um, so it's really um, an interesting thing to look at each you know, little detail of it. And then, and these were made, as I said, both paintings and watercolors and then um, taken back sort of as reminders of what uh, these American traders and ship captains had seen. Yeah. Um, the first ship that went from America to uh, China in 1784 was captained by John Green, who had, was from Philadelphia, had fought in the Revolutionary War, and then um, was appointed captain of the Empress of China, which was the first ship that um, went to Canton. And this is um, a cup and saucer from a dinner service that Captain Green ordered. Um, he, we don't think it was ordered on his first voyage there. He made a second voyage in 1786 and 87. Um, but this descended in the Green family. We have three cups and one saucer and has his monogram in the center. Mm -hmm. um, and he did record in his logbook uh, things that he purchased for himself in China. Um, he purchased spices and um, tea, silk, porcelain, that he you know, purchased on his own account and brought back. This is probably the most important piece of um, porcelain that we have in the collection. This is called a Hong bowl. 
Um, we, our photographer did this fancy thing where he unwrapped the bowl and you see that view across the bottom, which shows all the various hongs. And the hong was actually um, a building that was rented by a, each country. And that was where they conducted their business, where they um, you know, met with, um, met with Chinese, where they sometimes people lived there and each hong flew the flag of their uh, country. And so you see the American flag uh, here in the center of the bowl. Um, and, and obviously, you know, it wasn't um, made until after America had established relations with China in 1784. Um, we, we used to think, uh, actually, Green also has in his ship log that he did bring back what he called four factory bowls, which we think was something like this, because they were also called factories as well as homes. Um, we'd love to think this came back on the first voyage, but we don't think it did because there is a fence along the riverfront that a scholar told me was not built until 1787. So yeah. the bowl dates still to after 1787. But what's really cool about it is uh, this bowl did also descend in the Green family. Um, we purchased it at auction. Richard had actually owned two other Hong bowls um, that he had purchased early in his collecting career, but neither one had an American flag. So when this one came up for sale with an American flag, he was like, you know, I have to have this. Um, and what's great about it is on the interior of the bowl, and I think that might, yes, is a ship that um, we do believe is the Empress of China ship. There is a fan with a doc that's documented to have the Empress, that is the, an image of the Empress of China and um, it matches this ship. Right? Looks very so. much like the one in that over mantle that we were looking at earlier, the same sort of high stern with the poop deck and the round bluff bow. And... Mm -hmm. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, we also um, love that image so much that it's the back of the book, so. Mm. And then I, I wanted to include this since I figured there's some New England people watching. This is um, a, a punch bowl with a ship on the front. Actually, Richard, he loved maritime, he loved ships. There was a lot of porcelain created uh, soon after America started, you know, entering into the China trade. But most of the ships you can't identify. Um, but Richard Bottom, anyway, he loved ships. Um, but he did have a few that have been able to be identified. And this is actually a ship called uh, Rising State, which is a ship that was built in Providence in 1811 and began running between Providence, Rhode Island and I believe Charleston, South Carolina in 1812. So two sides of the bowl have this ship Rising State and the other two sides have a shield with a monogram and then the figure of hope leaning on an anchor, which is associated with um, the Rhode Island seal. So um, he did collect about 500 pieces of porcelain um, over the years. We have about 250 still in the collection. Um, yeah, here's the, the book, Richard, you wanna? Yeah, so I, uh, how to buy it? I guess I gave away the reveal too soon, but that's, that's, the, right. that's the, the inside of the Hong bowl is right there. And, um, the book actually, as I said before, it's um, through Yale Press and there is a 25% discount if you order it through yalebooks.com. It's $50 cover price, so it would you know, be 40. But I, and, and so if you do that, and I know this is being recorded so folks can kind of go back and reference the recording, but you enter the um, code Y-E-I-P-H and um, I-P-H is in pursuit of history I don't know what YE is, but that's the code. And But I really encourage if, if people are local, first of all, I hope that you'll visit um, the New Bedford Whaling Museum like you I'm sure do um, with some frequency. And I know that they are carrying some books there. Mm -hmm. So it'd be great to um, you know buy the books at the, at the bookstore and support the bookstore. Um, but we were thrilled with this um, book design and the photography and um, that was Gavin Ashworth who did the photography and he's so good with things like these three-dimensional shiny objects like porcelain and silver and, uh, and furniture. So I'm gonna stop the share and if people want to 
ask any questions, um, I'm gonna turn it back to the fuller view here. I did wanna remind people as well that um, next month, there will be no lo uh, local history guild uh, in June, but in July, uh, we're going to have a local history guild where we're gonna be talking about the history press, the history press in particular, we'll be talking with Peggy Medeiros, uh, uh, who's written this book on uh, Harriet Jacobs in New Bedford, uh, published by the History Press. We're going to be talking about an editor. We'll be talking with an editor from the History Press and Bob Demench from across the river in Fairhaven, one of our regular uh, local History Guild uh, attendees and an author of a uh, History Press book on the schooner coral in Fairhaven. So, um, so that's coming up in July. But uh, let's see. Oh, it doesn't look like we have any any further questions, um, Debbie and Richard. Well, great. Um, you know, one thing I did want to mention, Michael, is that, you know, in a book talk, normally we'd all be together, and I wish we could, but at the same time, how great is this that we're all able to, you know, be virtual together? But one thing, if anybody has already purchased the book or plans on purchasing the book, um, Debbie and I would be happy to write something that could go in the book. And so, you know, I could um, write something and then send it off to Debbie. And so you'd have kind of two uh, signatures in there. And I encourage you, I'll just give my email. Um, it's uh, hricharddietrich, all one word, hricharddietrich at yahoo.com. And so if anybody, you know, wants to do that and wants to uh, email, uh, we'd be thrilled to do that. Kind of a virtual book signing. And I bet if you purchased it at the New Bedford shop and you asked, Michael Dyer might come and yes, uh, yes. sign his chapter that he wrote on whaling. Exactly. <laughs> so we're really very appreciative of the I time. Will, I will do that only for these these people that are that are, <laughs> that are here tonight. Only them. Yeah. That's great. Hey, so, um, so somebody did ask, um, yeah. did, did your father collect anything else by William Bradford? And as far as I know, no. Um, am I correct on that, Debbie? Right. That was the yeah. only one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, but I think he loved Bradford, these, the Arctic, you know, those really kind of luminous scenes. But um, this one in particular really resonated as a, as a ship and the kind of peril it was in and the story, the Civil War connection. Um, well, I, I, I got to say, I'm just so um, thrilled, Michael. Thank you for doing this with us. And thank you, especially for writing the section that you did. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a great part of the book. And I, I hope that people do get the book. And I think that they'll enjoy it. I, I, think, I, I, I think so, too. I mean, I've got it at home, and I have it in, in the office. And I use it both places and, <laughs> and use it all the time. And, and not just, you know, I mean, it's, it's a great reference book and the photography is gorgeous and and you know it reminds me of Bill Reese and and uh, and the good times you know we sort of had coming down there to Philadelphia to do the research and hanging out with Debbie for a couple of days that was <laughs> great um, you know spending time in the Philadelphia Museum of Art behind the scenes you know getting you know, really getting to, to learn the, the the way that the Dietrich American Foundation actually functions you know, with this fabulous collection uh, and uh, and its contributions and learning the collection all, you know, to all the ins various institutions around the country. It's, uh, you know, it's just really, a, it was a really great experience to be part of. So um, were there other contributors? Yeah, there's a lot of other contributors to the book, Bob. Um, oh, um, yeah. So um, Kathy Foster and David Barquest, both at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Kathy wrote on paintings, David on silver. And then um, uh, Maury Heckscher, former head of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts American Wing wrote the foreword. He was a longtime friend of my dad's. And then Lisa Minardi wrote on Pennsylvania German objects, which was really an important part as well. And um, uh, who am I missing, Debbie? That Ned Cook. Ned Cook, Ned yes. Mm -hmm. Professor at Yale um, of decorative art, a tremendous scholar uh, wrote on furniture. And, um, and that's a great section as well, because furniture is really a key part of the collection. So Carl Cruz wants to know when we will see the collection at the Whaling Museum. Well, Carl, <laughs> I, uh, we're talking about it. And, uh, you know, if you, 
I think we should talk more about it because it's some great stuff. And and uh, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful collection. Um, so that'd be great. Thank you all for coming tonight. It was uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, Michael, thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, I appreciate and, it. Uh, Jocelyn, behind the scenes, thank you for your help. Indeed. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> thank you, you for presenting. Um, and I look forward to, to attending the July talk. That sounds fast. Oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Well, come along and ask lots of questions. Okay. Because, you know, the History Press has a lot to say. Great. Good Take night, care, folks. Everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.